Hello everyone and thank you for joining this talk. Before getting started, let me tell you that the slides for this talk are already available online and I'm going to be showing you a bunch of code examples, so that's why I like to share the slides before you can go and check them out later. So just grab a screenshot or scan the QR code, I'll give you also the link later. So here is a little story for you. Some time ago I was having a random song in my head, I don't know if that ever happens to you, and basically it didn't matter what I was doing all day, this song was coming back to my head. And the only thing that I wanted to do was basically listen to that song. But there was a little problem with it. I couldn't remember the title or the author of the song. So how could I remember that song? There must be a way to remember, right? And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the story and how I solved this problem using a bunch of interesting technologies. Last.fm and its own API, Node.js and async iterators. And hopefully by the end of this talk, we would have learned a few new interesting things about Node.js and async iterators. But let me introduce myself first. My name is Luciano and I am a senior architect at Fort Theorem. I work in Dublin, Ireland. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and an AWS certified solution architect professional. I am the co-author of this book, Node.js Design Patterns, and you can find me online in pretty much everywhere, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, my own blog, so feel free to connect. I'd love to chat with you later. Uh, very quickly about Fortirem, we are a consulting company mostly focused on AWS. We have been helping a bunch of small and big customers to migrate to AWS or to optimize their own workloads on AWS. If this is something interesting for you, let me know and let's connect. Also, we are hiring, so another reason to connect. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested in something like that. Okay, back to the story. There was this song in my head and I didn't really know what to do. I could only remember the word dark, which was probably in the title. So the first thing that I did, I went on Spotify and searched for the keyword dark. So that turned out not to be very helpful because funny enough, Spotify doesn't really give you a lot of detail or a lot of control when you try to do a search. Uh, it only shows you the first 1000 titles that match that keyword. And I was just scrolling through and I couldn't really see anything that really reminded me about that song. And then I suddenly remembered that I've been using a service called Last.fm for a long while. And if you never used it, it's basically like a social network for music where you can uh, use plugins to record all the um, um, songs that you have been listening to. So if you have your, your own music player and Spotify, for instance, supports that, the music player will be sending all the songs that you have been listening to. And over time, you are building a database with basically your musical interest. And this is my profile. I've been using it for a while. As you can see, I joined the platform in 2007 and I have been scrobbling, which is the terminology that Last.fm uses to say songs recorded, more than 250,000 songs. So hopefully that song must be there, even if I listened to it years ago. Okay, but how do we search in my personal music catalog? There is an API, so as a developer, this is something that I really like. And this API, even though it's not the newest, has been around for a while and you can see there's some XML, it's hopefully going to be good enough to help us to find the, the song that I'm looking for. So the first thing that looks interesting in the API is that there is this user get recent tracks method that we can invoke. And in theory, it should give us the most recent track that a user has been listening to. So in my case, I can use that for my profile and see what were the latest tracks. So I can start to build something programmatically that goes through my history of um, uh, songs and maybe search for the word dark in there. And maybe that way we'll find the song that we are looking for. So let's give it a shot and let's see what happens. If we want to try this uh, API with curl, I need an API key. Here I have it in an environment variable. So we, we can just run this command and see what happens. So it looks like we get some data in JSON format. Again, the format is not the prettiest, but hopefully something we can work with. But now the first thing that I want to do is convert this curl to JavaScript so we can add more and more business logic and be more flexible that way. So let's do that. Okay, very easy. I'm using a new client from the Node.js foundation called Undici, which is actually really, really cool. And basically I just need to import the request from that package. Then we can build a request where I'm specifying my own API key, 
my username, the method that we want to call, and the format for the response, which we expect to be JSON. At this point, I can construct the URL, I can specify the body for the request, make the request, read it, the, read the response uh, payload as a JSON, and we can console log the resulting data. If we do all of that, we should see something like this. Now, the first part is like a metadata part where we get a, uh, the sense that we are getting a paginated response because it's telling us this is page one of 50,000 something pages, sorry, 5,000 something pages for this particular user. And there is a total of more than 250,000 records. And then the second part is called track. And track is actually an array of all the tracks that are available in this page. Funny enough, there are 51 tracks and not 50 as specified there. So there is something dodgy here, but we'll find out more about that later. But the next question is, now that we know how to fetch the data for the first page, how do we go to the next page? And if we look again at the documentation of this method, we notice that there is a parameter that is called page and we can specify that as a query string parameter. So our intuition is that the first page will be page one, and then we can say page two, page three, page four, and we can keep iterating until the very last page. And it, that way we can traverse the entire history for my profile. Okay, let's update our script to do that. So we need to initialize a variable. Initial is gonna be one. Then we define a while true. So we're gonna iterate endlessly until we reach the very last page. At that point, we should break. So now as part of our query, we have a new parameter, which is page. So initially that's gonna be one. And everything else is the same. The only difference is that before uh, completing the loop, of course, we need to check if this is the very last page. So we are checking if the value of page is equal to the number of total pages that we get as a response. And if it's the last page, we break. And of course, we also need to increase the page counter every time we complete an iteration. So let's see how that looks like. So it looks like we are getting pages. As you can see here, there is a counter that is increasing. So that, that looks reasonably okay. Hopefully it's really working as we expect. Now let's have a look inside the tracks. So to do that, we can simply do a print because at the moment we were seeing object object. So we want to look a little bit closer into those objects and see if the data makes sense. So here, what we want to do is print the date. We want to print the name of the artist and the name of the track. And we also print some separators to actually visualize where a page ends. So we can distinguish between pages. How are we getting the data? Also here, I'm cheating a little bit because I changed the pagination size to 10. And this is just to visualize a little bit better how the data looks like across pages. And this is exercise is useful because we start to notice a bunch of weird things. The first one is that uh, there are songs that have undefined as a timestamp. And this seems to be always the first song for every page. Also, interesting enough, if you look at the second and the third page, the song is exactly the same. So this is a little bit suspicious. And the other thing, and this is even more concerning, is that between pages, so the last element of one page and the first element of another page, in this particular instance, looks exactly the same. And it's not like I was listening to the same song twice because the timestamp is exactly the same. So there are literally duplicates between pages. And this is something that might be a little bit confusing and hopefully we, we can get rid of just to avoid bugs and confusion. Now, this problem is actually very common in paginated APIs and it's called the sliding windows problem. And basically this problem happens when you are looking at data in a paginated way, but this data is not static. The data might be changing as you keep going through the data. So that means in our case that as I'm, list as I'm going through the data, I might be listening to new songs. So the data set is basically always moving. Okay, so let's try to visualize this problem to understand it a little bit better. So we're looking at tracks from the most recent to the oldest, and we are looking at this data in a paginated fashion. In this example, we are getting five, item five items at a time. And what are we doing is basically saying, okay, but at a certain point in time, 
because I'm listening to the music in the background while I go through the data, some new track will come in at the front because it's going to be the newest track. So at this point, if we look at the pages again, all the data has shifted to the left, right? So if we look at the last element of the first page before the new track, that element is now the first element of the second page. So this is why we were getting the duplication and this is a little bit annoying. Now let's see if there is something we can do to get rid of this problem. And one thing that we can do is to switch from the page parameter and use another parameter that is called two. And two is basically an end timestamp. So we can do a pagination based on timestamps. Let's see how that looks like, but we are gonna call this time-based windows. So again, we have tracks from the newest to the oldest. This time we only fetch page one. And after we fetch page one, we take the last track of that uh, page and we are gonna call the timestamp of that track T1. Then in order to fetch the next page, what we are gonna do is basically say, fetch the first page, but before T1. And that basically means setting the parameter two to T1. Now, before and two is a little bit confusing, but keep in mind that here we are going in reverse order from the newest to the oldest. So from the biggest timestamp to the smallest timestamp. So what we do, we can keep going this way and we keep fetching only one page at the time. We don't really know how many pages there are. And for every next page, we basically take the last timestamp from the previous page to determine the starting point of the next page. And when are we done? We are done when we get an empty page or when the num page, which is the uh, total number of pages, is one, which means we are at the very last page. Okay, let's try to change our business logic to implement this, this idea. Uh, now we just need to swap the uh, page parameter with the two parameter. Initially, it's gonna be empty, which means take the most recent for the uh, last FM API. And again, we need to make sure that's used in our query string. And now the condition to check if we are at the very last page changes a little bit because we just need to check if total pages is minor or equal to one. Also, we want to make sure we update our pointer. So we read the next timestamp by looking at the last track in the current page and we take the timestamp of that one. Okay, let's see if this looks a little bit better. Now, if we look at the timestamps, they seem to make sense. So hopefully our implementation is perfectly correct. So the boundary matches as expected. And now we don't see any more duplicates, as you can see. So um, this seems okay. seems like we are actually fixing the problem. Now that we have a working solution, can we generalize it? So for instance, the idea is I'm coming to this a little bit as a library author is, okay, I'm trying to solve my own problem, but if I manage to generalize this problem, maybe other people can have a nice way to fetch data from Last.fm and they can do whatever they want with it. So they can build their own custom behavior on top of this uh, sliding window time-based solution that we built. So for instance, we could build a generic reader class or object if you want. And this object, once instantiated with an API key and a username, should be able to expose this information in a nice way that you can programmatically control and maybe do search, maybe you can do analysis, you can save it to a database, you basically can do whatever you want with the data that is coming in. So I started to wonder, okay, what is the nicest interface that we can expose in JavaScript and not JS so that people can use it in a nice way they don't have to they, they will basically have a nice developer experience so i started to look back at everything i knew and the first thing that came to my mind is okay i could build an interface based on callbacks so for instance the reader object will have a read pages method and when that method is called you can specify what needs to happen for every page and what needs to happen in case of an error and you specify those behaviors by passing two different callbacks to this function this is one way, but I wasn't super happy with the idea of callbacks. So I kept thinking and trying to find different ideas. And another approach that came to my mind is using event emitter. If you are a Node.js developer, this is something that you have probably seen a lot because event emitters are used heavily in Node.js. 
So the idea is that, okay, we could have a method called read, which as soon as we trigger it, it's going to start to consume the data from Last.fm. And then we can have events. For instance, we can have an event called page, which will trigger our own callback if we set up a listener for it. And that page means we have a page, you can read the data from that page. And then we can have another event completed. And that event can give you the idea of when we completed iterating over all the data. In this case, I'm also using it for errors, but we could have had another reader on error dedicated event. Again, this seems like a good idea, but I was trying to think, okay, are there better ways? And because I'm a big fan of streams in Node.js, of course, another idea might be to use streams for this because streams are the perfect abstraction. If you have data that is coming in, uh, but the data will come in in different chunks and you might want to start consuming the data as soon as you have some chunk available. So streams, not surprising, I built on top of uh, Node.js event emitters. So the interface that we have here is actually very similar to the interface we saw before with raw event emitters. So another interesting thing is that if you use streams, you can use the pipeline operator. And the pipeline operator basically gives you um, a nice way to um, combine different streams from a reader, transform stream, and then a writable. And you can easily handle errors on co and completion by using a callback. So this is something I recommend you if you're going to use streams. But now, again, I was trying to think, okay, what else can we do? And then I remember, okay, but actually async iterators are a perfect use case for this. And the first reason is because you can write a for await and a for await is amazing because it looks like writing a simple for loop. So that will basically consume every single page for every single iteration. And it's going to wait for you to ex execute another iteration until the next page is available. And even better, the code is going to look sequential because everything you write after the for await is going to happen only after you have been iterating through all the data and there is nothing else available. So if you have things that you want to do at the end, you can simply write the code after the for await. But even better than that is error handling because error handling can be unified. You can just put a try catch around the for await and this try catch will capture both synchronous and asynchronous errors. So you have a nice way to manage all kinds of errors that can happen while going through these tracks. So if you have, for instance, uh, an access to a property that doesn't exist, that's asynchronous error and the try catch will work. But also if you have an asynchronous error that derives from trying to, to do some asynchronous operation, that will also be captured correctly and you will be using your catch to handle that particular error. Okay, so now the, the next question you might have, okay, we want to make this API an async iterator, how do we do that? And in order to understand that, we need to explore the iteration protocols. And I'm going to speed up a little bit here just to make sure we, we have the time to cover everything. So just to clarify something, there are two concepts that are very similar and uh, it might, they might be confusing. So let's try to define the difference between an iterator and an iterable. You can imagine an iterator as an arrow that points sequential data. And the only thing that it knows, you can tell it, go to the next item and it only knows how to do that. It basically gives you a current item and you can keep calling next to go to the next item. And of course, it's going to tell you when there are no more items left. An iterable is a slightly higher level concept. It's the idea that you have a collection and you can iterate over that collection going one element uh, one by one and get all the elements one at a time. So generally, an iterable is built by giving you an iterator, and with that iterator, you can get all the data. So you can imagine the iterator as a plain arrow and an iterable as a collection, and you can get an arrow to go through the data. Okay, so how do we implement the, the first protocol? And the first protocol is the iterator protocol. We need to define an object, and this object needs to have a very specific uh, um, shape. And the shape is basically that you need to have a function called next. And this uh, function will return an object. And this object contains only two keys, a key that says done. And this is a Boolean, so it can be true or false and a value. So value is the current value that we are emitting from the iterator. 
and Don is basically telling us is this the last value or not. Let's see how we can do that with a very simple example. Let's imagine we are building a countdown and we want to go from a certain value to zero. So how do we do that and make it an iterator? We said we need to return an object and this object needs to have a next method. And this method can return done true if we already reached zero or it can return done false and the current value if we are still iterating. How do we use it? We can basically say we create a countdown and we start from three and then we keep calling dot next dot next dot next and you can see that what we get in return is value three, value two, value one, value zero and finally we get done true. Now if you know generators, generators are a nice um, syntactic sugar to create iterators. So we can rewrite all our previous code exactly like this. So a generator is basically a special function that you define with an asterisk in front of the name. And then you can use this keyword called yield. And when you use yield, basically what happens is that the JavaScript runtime suspends the execution of that function. It will yield that particular value. And if you call the function again, it will resume the execution of the function. And it will also remember the value of every single variable. So if we write the code that way, we can use it exactly in the same way. So it works almost like the same thing. The only difference is how the, the value is emitted in case of done true. Okay, um, now let's look at the iterable protocol. So the iterable protocol is basically um, uh, a way to define that an object is iterable. And to do that, you have to implement a special method called symbol.iterator, which is a zero argument function that just returns an iterator. So to be an iterable, an object needs to have symbol.iterator and that function returns an iterator, which is something that we just defined in the previous protocol. So if we want to convert our countdown example into an iterable, what we do is we return an object. This object needs to implement this special symbol.iterator function. And this is a function that doesn't take any argument and it returns an iterator. And if you look closely here, this is the, exactly the previous code that we wrote before, because we knew that that previous code was an iterator. Now, because we know that we can use generators to define an iterator, we can also rewrite the previous code like this, which is a little bit nicer to read and write. What is the nice thing about iterables? Iterables allows you to use a higher level syntax, which is the for off. And with for off, you can basically say rather than calling dot next, dot next, dot next manually and having to check, is it done? Is it done? Is it done? You can just do a for loop. And inside that for loop, you will get the current value and you can just use it without having to unwrap data from that uh, particular object returned by the iterator. So with this approach, you just do a for loop and you get three, two, one, and zero. So much nicer to read and write again. Okay, but all this stuff is synchronous. We want to do HTTP, we want to call APIs, so we need to do the same things, but in an asynchronous way. How do we do all of that? Surprise, there are equivalent protocols for async. So there is an async iterator protocol, which is very similar. Again, we use, we build an object, that object needs to have a next method. That next method needs to return an object with a certain shape. But the interesting thing is that this time it doesn't return the object straight away, but it returns a promise that resolves to that object. So that gives us a way to make returning object asynchronous. We just return a promise and that promise will resolve to an object with the shape done and value. So now let's try to do again the idea of a countdown example, but this time before one event, one event and another, we can specify a delay, for instance, of one second. So what, how do we do that? We basically say, because next this time needs to return a promise, the easiest way to do that is just to make the next function async. Then what we do, we wait the given delay, for instance, could be one second. And then everything else is pretty much the same. Again, by being this function async, implicitly the return will be a promise and this promise will be resolved to one of the two possible values. 
when effectively we complete this asynchronous function. How do we use it? Again, we create our async countdown, we start from tree, and we keep calling dot next, dot next, dot next. But the difference is that this time, for every invocation, we need to await that promise in order to actually have the value. And you can see that this time the value will be 3, 2, 1, 0, and eventually we are done. If you want to run this code, you're going to see something like this. And you can tell that we are waiting more or less one second between one element and another. So this seems to work as expected. Again, we can use generators as a syntactic sugar. And the funny thing in JavaScript, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that a function can be both an async function and a generator function. And that basically looks like this. You have both the async keyword and the asterisk. And you can use both await and yield in the same function. So this is pretty cool stuff that you can do with JavaScript. Now, the last protocol we need to discuss is async iterable, which is basically the idea that you have an object. This object contains a collection, but this collection is not available already. It's something that will come up over time. So you, it's going to be somewhat an asynchronous collection. And the protocol looks very similar to the synchronous counterpart. You have a symbol dot async iterator method that you need to implement. And that method just needs to return an async iterator. So let's look at for our async countdown. We just need to implement this. And this is going to be, is going to be returning our iterator from the previous example. OK, an interesting thing is that if you use async generators, by default, they already create async iterables. So we don't even need to specify symbol async iterator. And basically, this code is going to be, by default, both an async iterator and async iterable. So you can see how generator functions are very powerful to abstract the concept of iterators. Now, the nice thing of async iterables is that we can use that for await syntax that we were talking about at the very beginning of the talk. So basically, if we write this code with for await, we can see that something like this happens. Basically, we just get uh, 3, 2, 1, and 0. And this is convenient because we don't have to think when to break. We don't have to check the return object to understand when it's done. We don't have to call dot .next and await it manually for every single call. So now that we know how async iterable work and how to implement one, let's try to apply this knowledge to our uh, lastfm uh, object. So we have our business logic here. What we need to do to create an async iterator is basically, or an async iterable as well, is basically to define the function as both async and generator function. Then what we do is basically saying, pretty much everything we wrote before. The only difference is that now when we have the data available, what we do is we just yield the data. So whoever is consuming the uh, iterable can just take the data and do whatever they want with it. And that's basically everything we need to do. How do we use it? We instantiate our object. And then because this object is going to be an async iterable, we can just use a for await. And in this case, for every page that we get out of the iterable, we just want to print this page. And this is going to look something like this. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that we get uh, data page by page. Now, we haven't solved our problem yet. We still don't know the title of the song that I was looking for. So how do we do that? Let's try to write to use our library that we just created. And every time we get a page, we can go through every single track and try to filter out and take and keep only the, the tracks that contain the word dark in the title. So how do we do that? We create our instance of the lastfm client, and then we do a for await. Then inside, for every single page, we check every single track in that page and if the track name contains the word dark, then we just print that particular track. So I did all of this and I let it run for a while because I had hundred thousands of songs in my history. 
And basically what happened is that eventually, these were some of the results, I was reading them and eventually I noticed this title. And this title was very familiar and it was actually the song I was looking for. And if you look at the timestamp, this was basically nine years ago. So I have no idea how this song came back randomly to my brain after having listened to it for more than nine years. Okay, so just to close up this talk, I hope you learn about async iterators and all the other async and synchronous protocols that you can use in JavaScript and not JS. But one interesting thing is that when you create your own custom async iterator or all the other iterator iterable protocols, you can always build additional behavior on top of them and make a smart interface that users can, can use them confidently. For instance, one thing that I noticed while doing this exercise is that occasionally the Last.fm API would return a 500 or a 503, so the API wasn't really stable. And I was very annoyed because after waiting for like 20 or 30 minutes to go through all the data, it was just suddenly crash and I need to restart from scratch. So one thing that I implemented as part of my own custom iterable is integrated error handling and automatic retries. So basically, if there was that kind of error, like a transient error, the iterator will automatically retry internally. So as a user, you don't have to be concerned with that problem. And if you want to see how that looks like, I actually built a small library. So you can check out this link and the code for that particular library. And that's everything I have for today. Thank you very much. And hopefully you'll have some nice feedback for me. So I look forward to hearing more from you. Bye. Wow, it's a very cool presentation from Luciano. So often we have to call APIs and then there's a lot of pages there and we are usually confused. How can we do that? So that's a very great presentation from Luciano. So now we have the solution after uh, getting some problems similar like that. So Luciano, there are some questions and I would like to share the first one. So how can we find a song with just listening to a small part of it, is it's a very large database of songs. So how can they do it so fast? Yeah, actually, I, I don't know if I know the answer to this question. I think there was an article some time ago that was explaining how you could create like an index of parts of a audio track, I guess, if you want to generalize the problem, and then use that index for search. So you collect other I don't know, sample data by recording from a microphone or something like that and use that information for comparing the search. But I, I honestly have no idea how to implement something like that myself. So if somebody knows or somebody has links, I think it would be very cool to share them because it's somewhat relevant to this talk and I would be very curious to read it. Oh, uh, tried to make Sasam like 10 years ago, but it's quite challenging to compare the uh, music and with the database and like indexing. Yeah, that's quite uh, complicated in the back part. Yeah, the back end part. So uh, I also am very interested in uh, how can we know uh, how many pages are there? Maybe you can give explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the case of Last.fm, that really depends uh, from how they, they, they give you the data through the API. And uh, for instance, you get different results depending if you use the, the different parameters that I showed in the talk. So if you use the page parameter, so you go from page one, two, and three, and four, and so on. Every time you get a page in the metadata, you also know exactly what's the total number of pages. So you can tell, okay, if I am at page five and there are 10 pages, there are only other five pages left. The problem is that when you start to use more dynamic filtering, like when I, when I switch from the page number to the two parameter, uh, and you also have data that is dynamically changing all the yeah. time, you just get a number of pages that is not necessarily going to match your next yeah. query. So I think the best bet you have there, and this at least was the way I implemented it, is when you see that you have no more pages left, that means that if you try to call another page, there is not going to be any data. So at that point, you, it's probably safe enough to, to stop. Okay. 
And how about what is your recommendation on saving the results? Uh, if there are so much pages, what should be the best practice for us to uh, save the results? And I think some results are not important, but some results are important. And sometimes there's a um, mismatch. And how do you recommend to save the results in a better way? Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding the question, one cool thing that you get with async iterators but also with, with streams in, in general, is that as soon as you have some data, for instance, in our case, the, the content of a page, which might be, I don't know, 20 or 50 tracks, you can already take all that information and do something with it. So if you're, instance, if you're trying to save it to a CSV file or a database, for example, you don't need to wait for all the tracks to come through and then you do like a huge save at the end. Maybe you, do, you wouldn't even have enough memory in your machine to do all yeah. of that. But with streams or async iterators, you can just take every single chunk of data and save it, and you keep appending that way. And this will be very efficient, but also it's gonna be it's gonna allow you to consume even potentially infinite amount of data because you are always streaming the data that you're getting yeah. these babies, rather than just waiting indefinitely for the data to, to come through. Okay. There's also, uh, Victor said that the next step will be to add a search to the lips so anyone can just pass the keyword and have a result. Oh yeah, that could be a nice pull request if you want to contribute. Thank you for that suggestion. Okay. Any other questions maybe from the participants? I think it's a very insightful code and we can learn so much. So. Do you, uh, do you have many of these problems in your work? So what is the most challenging thing about uh, using iterators? Maybe you have some difficulties that you found during your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the pagination example is probably the most common. I, I, I've been working a lot with AWS lately. And uh, it's actually really nice that the, the latest AWS SDK for JavaScript as all these concepts built in. So for instance, if you're using DynamoDB and you want to read data from a DynamoDB table, you are getting different pages. The object that you get uh, is already an async iterator, so you can just use that for a wait. So that, that's very convenient. But I also had to implement in the past uh, uh, like workers that needed to consume jobs from a queue. And that's also another nice case where you could implement uh, the interface for the worker as an async iterator, and then you just write everything in a for loop. And basically with that for loop, you, you are automatically waiting for new jobs to be available before you repeat another iteration of, of the loop. So these are some use cases that come to mind where async iterators actually give you a very nice interface. There is another one that is really interesting that is uh, that was initially promoted by Dino, the, the alternative to Node.js. And they show in their own HTTP library that you can create a server and then you create the handler for requests by doing a for await loop. And that's a really interesting one because there are some caveats. Like you might, if you're not careful, you might end up processing one request at a time. So your server will be very, very slow. So that's a case where it might be, it might look nice to use that abstraction, but it might also be dangerous. So be careful. If you see something like that, make sure you really understand how the event loop works and make sure that you benchmark your server to, to make sure that you are not effectively blocking one request at a time before processing the next one. Yeah, great to hear your answer. Uh, there's also a question about any tips on debugging generators when using yield. Uh, I tried recently and used away array from a lot. Yeah, that's a good question. I I didn't ever need to do that like too much in depth, so I might be missing something obvious there. To be honest, I, I would expect that a debugger can uh, show you the steps when you use yield asterisk. If that's not the case, I I can see how that's that's a little bit dangerous because you when you do yield asterisk, you're basically delegating a generator to another generator. So the, the original generator is just going to stop, move the control to the other generator, and it's not going to resume until the other generator has finished. So it's like 
something like a recursive call, if you want, of generators. And I'm wishing that yeah, debuggers allow you to see that jump and see what, what's happening in the inner generator. If that's not the case, yeah, it's I, I suppose it's, it's not a lot of fun to, to try to debug those things. Yeah. So sorry yeah. if I don't have a better answer to, to this question. Yeah. Someone also asked to where we can use the generator. Yeah, it's um, it's something that doesn't come up too often, I think, in, in, in JavaScript in general. Like you can probably go a long way without having to use generators. Uh, I think the most common use case is the one we discussed today. So when you are building your own custom iterators or iterables, I think it can be very convenient to use generators because uh, they give you a nicer interface to manage the, the state. Like sometimes if you if you want to avoid to use generators, you can, but you need to build like a mini state machine yourself. And it's a lot more code. It's easy to do mistakes with generators. It, it can be easier to do it. Uh, other cases in general where you want to, you, when you are not really sure how the data is going to be used by somebody using it like a library, and you want to build that library in a way that if people want to use the data piece by piece, like every time there is some data available, they can use it straight away. Or if they just want to accumulate all the data in one go, like in a large array, they can do both things. Generators actually build, give you like a result that allow people to, to do both. So if you want to build something flexible, that can be another use case for, for generators. Uh, thank you very much. And all other questions can be asked directly for Luciano. There's a, your social media, yeah, your Twitter. You have shared your Twitter uh, page. And anyone that needs to ask more questions can contact Luciano. And he also has a great book about Node.js design patterns. So you can also check it out. Thank you, thank Luciano, you so much, for your talk. Thank you, everyone else. Yes, see you. Bye.